there's no substitute just for getting out and experiencing it. Um, there's almost no way to screw it up. Get to a trailhead. Start walking. Welcome back to the Out and Back podcast. I'm your host, Shanti, and that was Alan Dixon, author and host of the extremely popular and trusted backpacking website, AdventureAllen.com. On his website, Adventure Allen keeps his readers up to date with all the latest gear reviews, off the beaten path trip reports, and ridiculously light gear lists. An engineer, let's just say Allen's a little bit on the technical side, constantly comparing pounds and ounces and other stats in his articles. And this is all very helpful, but today, we're going beyond the specs, and we're putting down the spreadsheets, and we're going to get to the softer side of hiking with Alan Dixon. Alan tells us about his 50 years of hiking, living through the entire ultralight revolution of backpacking. He talks about the benefits of doing shorter high routes, where you get the best bang for your buck, instead of taking on the giant triple crown of long trails in case you don't have four or five or even six months to kill. Alan's also going to tell us about his craziest story from the mountains, a time when he thought he was going to die. He talks about the controlled chaos of growing up with adventurous parents and how that trained him to love the outdoors from an early age. He talks about fear and how it gets in the way of lightening your backpack or even getting outside. Alan encourages everyone to put fear and excuses aside and simply put two feet on the trail and go. But before you get too far, though, and before we get going with this interview, you're going to need the best backcountry navigation app out there to help you find your way. Gaia GPS gives you access to all of the best backcountry maps you need, including Nat Geo Trails Illustrated, USGS Topo Maps, satellite imagery, weather forecasting layers, and even integration with Apple CarPlay. And we have really good news. Right now, Gaia GPS is offering up to a 50% discount on memberships to all of you podcast listeners. Make sure to visit GaiaGPS.com slash podcast. That's G-A-I-A, GPS.com slash podcast. Or visit our show notes on our blog to snag the great deal. So with all that said, we'd better do what Alan says and get our feet on the trail. So here we go. So nice to speak with you today, Adventure Alan. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. A pleasure to be here. There's so many amazing things that you've been doing in the great outdoors over the years, backpacking, biking, mountaineering, rafting, you name it. So we'd love it, Alan, if we could really start this off, if you could tell us a story from one of your adventures. Uh, God, it's hard to think of which one. Um, I guess I guess one that sort of covers it all, that sort of um, especially um, the dangers of hubris um, is one I'll tell. And this is back in the um, early aughts. And uh, my climbing partner and I were going to do, um, well, Mark Twight was like really big then. And this sort of single push climbing was a big deal where you just, you basically, rather than something that would take two or three days, you just go minimal gear, ultra, ultra light, and you just, blast through this thing and you get it done in a single push. Um, so we were going to do that for the the middle Teton and summon it um, and then be down in time to have dinner with our friends. Um, but I guess I didn't think it through too clearly because, um, well, you'll see how it plays out. But anyway, um, the day we were going to sort of go to start to climb the middle Teton. Um, I was still in Washington, D.C. Um, I got up at 4 a.m. in the morning on four hours of sleep, caught a 6 a.m. flight out of D.C. to Montana, met my climbing partner. We we drove to Jackson Hole. We're packing up gear in the dark under a in a parking lot under a, like a street lamp. And um, it was beautiful. Um, we were hiking up uh, to the middle Teton in the dark and, and the elk were bugling. It was late in the year. It was cold. And you know, we were timing it to reach the, the foot of the middle Teton glacier right around dawn to start start climbing. And the idea was we'd just go boom, 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 boom up the glacier, no problem. And then we get to the saddle 
we transition out of our crampons, we get some trail runners on, we blast up that, we just free climb the, you know, low fifth class rock section without a rope, be up the summit, go down the third class route down the backside and be down in, in Jackson for dinner with our friends. Um, and as they say, you know, uh, well, yes. And things just didn't start off right from the beginning. We, we got onto the glacier. Um, the ice was wrong. It was broken and dinner plating on us. And we had some communication errors. And we, we got to the saddle very late in the day, probably four hours behind schedule. Um, and then we looked up at this, this summit block and, you know, what should have been nice, solid rock, easy to climb is it's all verglass. And for those of you who don't know what verglass, it's like alpen, alpineering nightmare. Um, what it is is that it snowed a couple of days before, warmed up, melted, and then refrozen. So there's like this half inch sheet of ice over all the rock. You can't use your crampons on it. You can't climb on it. Um, and we're trying to get up this this thing, trying to figure out how to dry tool or what the heck we're going to do up it. And we just, we get stuck. We can't do it. Um, and and then um, sort of in a perfect storm, literally a perfect storm, one of these sort of circulating storms starts on, on, on the middle Teton. Um, and the temperature drops, the wind picks up, it's snowing, it's starting to white out on us. And we have to rappel back down to the saddle where we at the top of the glacier. And we're just sitting there and we're like, we don't have any food. We don't have any water. We have a third of the climbing equipment we actually need to rappel down the glacier. So that's not an option. It's cold as hell. It's snowing. We only have these thin belay jackets. We don't have any warm clothing and we're screwed. Like we're, we're, we're out of options. Um, and we're just sort of sitting there and, and we do have a cell phone and, and cell phone does work there even back in the aughts. And we're like, what do we do? Well, we can't really call for rescue because I mean, there's no way that anybody's going to get a chop or anything up here tonight. Um, so we, we get on the cell phone and we call the restaurant that we're supposed to meet our friends. And we just leave the simple message. Uh, sorry, we were delayed. Um, we won't be able to make dinner. And could you just please tell our party that? And we hang up. Understatement. <laughs> and <laughs> so, you know, and then it sort of occurs to me, we're going to die up here. Like it just sort of sinks in, you know, we're, this is just, you know, it's not great. Um, and there's always that moment of panic when you realize, wow, we really screwed the pooch here. You know, we, we were, we were uh, really overestimated our abilities and what we could do. And, you know, we kind of got only ourselves to blame for being up here. Um, and, you know, it's odd at that point in time, um, you know, it just seemed really easy just to simply lie down. Just, you know, we didn't have a tent or a bivy or, you know, just lie down and just, like, go to sleep. Like, it would be so bad. Um, and then, so this overwhelming sense of calm came over me. Oh, my gosh. Was it, at like, an effect of hypothermia or was it just... No, no, it wasn't. Um but, you know, I said, I'm not going to die here. I, I'm going to die 100 feet lower. And I talked to my climbing partner, and we sort of got our stuff together, and we didn't really even have enough hardware to get down. We were going to go down this gully down the other side. We didn't even know if it went. I mean, we, we had no idea. We could see it was the gully from hell. It was full of ice and snow and rock, and it was going to be just ugly as all. I'll get out, but we're just like, yeah, we're going to do this. So, um, you know, by this time it's really dark and it's really cold. It's probably dropping, dropping. It might be dropping almost into the teens at that point. And again, you don't have 
any cold weather gear at all for being in the team. Like, no, just these thin blade, blade jackets, no warm pants. I mean, it's just, yeah. Um, and, and there is a sense, you know, um, that your life force is ebbing out of you. I don't know how to describe it, but you, you know, you're dying. You know, you're on a, a limited time frame. You, you can only go far so long in this and, and you can just sort of feel the, the life force leaving your body. Um, but we, you know, and we don't have enough hardware to get down the gully. We just got a few pieces of protection. Um, and so we're literally chopping belay anchors by chopping, you know, bollards into the ice and snow and doing whatever we can not to use our hardware to get down this. And we've got this rope that's too short. So we have to do a series of, of smaller rappels and, and, you know, I'm going down first and my finding partner's coming down after me. And I'm just sitting in the bottom of this, this gully, which is just this incredible junk rut, just cowered in fetal position as, you know, as he's coming down, rocks are pinging off of my body and dinging off the top of my helmet. And, you know, we're, we're repelling off these cliff bands and you're, feet hit ice and everything flattens out and you slam your head against the rock. And it's just, it's ugly. There's just nothing, nothing pretty about it. But, you know, we get down a hundred feet and I'm like, I'm not going to die here. I'm going to die a hundred feet lower. Um, and we just keep repeating that and our headlights, headlights get dim and eventually stop working. And, uh, you know, and then the hallucinations start kicking in. They start audible, and then they they slowly go visual. And I, you know, thinking about it, at that point, I've been up and moving two days straight without sleep on four hours of sleep in extreme conditions, too, high elevation, <laughs> but cold temperatures. You know, again, I'm feeling very calm. I'm just very focused. It's it's more like this out of body experience where I'm just observing myself going down the mountain rather than just sort of having skin in the game, I guess. I just, I just very much feel like I'm, I'm operating at a higher plane and I'm just very like, I need, I need to do this. I need to do that. Um, so we get down and we have this one big cliff band. We have to get down out of this gully. Um, and then we're out on the Talos field and we're out of, we're out of hardware we don't have anything to repel off of. And we're wandering around. And I, I swear to God, this is true. We're wandering around. And I find this, this hex, this hex chalk um, with a ratty sling attached to it. And I come back and we, we place it. And I, 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 I can't even explain to you why I could find that in the dark or why it was there. Um, I, maybe I'll touch on that later in the, later in the story, but, um, we repel down that last bit that, that piece of hardware that I found gets us down and we're in the, the talus field. At this point, the, the hallucinations are just wild. I mean, yeah, my so tell me looks, a, yeah I was going to say, go tell me about these hallucinations. Like, what were you seeing? What were you experiencing? So when we get down to the talus field, my partner goes, shh. He goes, see all those tents over there? All those people, we don't want to wake them up. They're sleeping. And I'm like, oops. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's a problem. And, and then I look at the ground, and, like, there's all these beautiful fly boxes with these fluorescent flies. They're just like glowing purple and blue and green. And they're the most beautiful flies I've seen. And they're all over. So I'm like, why would people leave all these beautiful flies like all over here? And this just, this continues on. And, and as we're going out and, and, and I should say at this point, you know, one of the things that's been kind of a, a bane of my existence is that, I don't really have an off button. Um, my mother used to tell me that it, she knew it was time for me to go to bed when I started running faster, but I started hitting, running into things. 
Um, but in the, in this case, I think, you know, my climbing partner was, was having periods of, of blackout where he just, he would be walking beside me, but he wasn't there. He was completely non-responsive. Um, and, and I was still functional. Um, so we go out and, and, you know, at some point he, he's like, oh, wow, you know, I just, had a really nice conversation with the lady ranger back there who was, was painting this beautiful picture in the easel. And I'm like, I'm seeing six foot um, long crayfishes swimming in the creek, or there was a yellow Volkswagen, Volkswagen beetle driving up the, the trail towards us. So we finally get to trailhead and we're looking at each other as we get the car keys out and we're like, Given the hallucinations, who's driving to town? <laughs> and then one of you says, oh, we'll drive up to that town we saw in the Talus field. <laughs> pretty much something like that. You know, you come down out of this. It's, a, it's an event that you think is going to be essentially an afternoon. And this took how long again? You know, probably um, I went two and a half days on four hours of sleep. Um, much of it technical or a fair more sh- fair portion of it full on technical climbing ice climbing i don't know i mean uh, my my take home from that is is there's this this i, I, I read john o'donohue is sort of a, a poet and a philosopher spiritual guy he's got this book on beauty and and one of the things in his book of beauty <clears throat> he talks about um this is an irish thing that if there's a a small harp that's out of tune and it's brought into the room with a, a larger harp, um, it will come into tune with the larger harp. It will sound in tune. Um, and my best sense of what happened on that mountain is that, you know, at, at some point when I was sitting up there contemplating, you know, what was going to happen that, and I had this sense I wasn't alone that it wasn't me that got me off the mountain. And I think, I think, you know, my, my inner harp had, had come into tune with the mountain, that the mountain had essentially taken me under its protection. You know, the mountain and I were, the mountain was helping me down. It's amazing of a contrast because I would also wonder, you have this feeling of the mountain guiding you down. The mountain is protecting you. And that seems to be so much more of a positive way of looking at a very rough experience in nature as opposed to having a negative experience and then almost having like a begrudging feeling towards the mountain. Yeah, I, I carry that with me on every trip, whether it's just a, a day hike or or a harder trip. This The sense that I'm not alone. Um, you know, that, that I, I, in some sense, try and come into harmony to bring my smaller harp into harmony with the larger harp of the environment that I walk through. Um, and that, that's never left me. So, you know, they always, you know, what we think is a disaster in life sometimes can be a an enormous gift if we choose to look at it that way. And, and I've always thought of this experience as is really, it changed me profoundly in a way that um, I'm deeply grateful for um, because that, that gift has permeated my life from that moment on. I think a lot about, uh, I can't remember who said the quote, but I think it really applies to this situation about how life happens. Life is, you know, 5% what happens to us and 95% how we react to it. Yeah. Um, and I just, I just feel very fortunate that, you know, I was very receptive yeah. and open to, to letting that happen. I, I want to talk about this too, um, you know, a little more later on the show. We talk about, you know, why we go out into nature, what we're looking to get out of it, what we can experience. Um, but before we do that, I want to talk. I want to talk with you about a few more things. I actually want to come back to uh, 
when you talked about how you don't have an off button and your mother noticed that from an early age. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I kind of want to get, um, yeah. and I'm sure all of us listening to this would love to get a little bit more of the background story of what made Adventure Allen Adventure Allen. You know, tell me a bit about like um, growing up. Tell me a bit about um, what got you really into nature and made you want to start being in the outdoors and eventually becoming Adventure Allen. Well, I, you know, I grew up with two very sort of athletic, um, sort of high power charging adults. My parents, uh, my parents were were very young. Uh, they were nineteen when I was born, um, and we have this this sort of collective family joke that we all sort of grew up together and raised each other together, parents and children. Which is, and my brother, which is sort of a joke, and it's sort of true. Um, but, uh, you know, my, my father was active in the Sierra Clubs and the Audubon Club, interested in the outdoors and nature in his teens. I think it was an escape from his family, which was much more sort of mainstream American suburban. Um, and uh, so, you know, we just had this crazy childhood. We, I took my first backpacking trip into the, into the Sierras out of, out of Yosemite Valley when I was four or five four or five wow and i carried i carried my own sleeping bag in which in 19 1965 was you know a, like a four or five pound affair of cotton and god knows what it was about the size of most of our backpacks these days but um you know we were always out doing some crazy thing i mean we used to, you know, even when we were just like five, five, maybe we were six or seven, the whole family would swim out of Stinson Beach and swim out through the breakers and just float around in, in the Pacific. Uh, my parents saw no no problem with that. And we didn't have wetsuits then or anything. So, um, And my father, you know, we would go away on the weekends. My father would come home from night and they'd pack up our, our van, which had a bed in the back, and they'd throw my brother and I in the back and we drive off into the night and we, you know, parents would wake us up by the side of the road, some logging road or something, you know, just way out of the way in California. And then, you know, we just sleep in the, sleep in the dirt by the side of the road. I, my family didn't own a tent until I think I was 16 or something. Um, you can tell we didn't live in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> um, but, you know, sometimes, you know, like in the middle of the night, like, you know, even though you're sleeping, this fam would come to a screeching halt. We're like, what happened? What happened? And, you know, the we're driving on these like really remote logging roads in California and a van that probably shouldn't be on them in the first place. And there's a road closed sign. And my father gets out of the van and, you know, 1 a.m. and moves the sign and drives around it. And we're going down the road at like, you know, 30 miles an hour. And then there is no road. It's like 2,000 feet down into a canyon. And we're like, oh. So all these adventures like that with your family, what was probably the craziest one? I don't know. I mean, my father would do things like, you know, we'd be going through and, and there'd be like a car stuck in a Ford for river. And my father would just gun it. Like rather than like stop or look at the Ford, he's like, we need to get up more speed here. And uh, we just go floating through the river. Like, you know, the car would like float on momentum and the wheels would catch on the other side. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it didn't. Sometimes we were four of us in the river trying to get the car up onto solid ground again. And that motivated you. Like at no point as a child, like that growing up was like, wow, like crazy, scary things like that didn't deter you at all from the outdoors. I thought it was normal. <laughs> I had no basis of comparison. Um, I think that helps, you know, this sense of sort of exuberance and and this sort of non-fear-based, non-conservative approach to life, um, not, not caring that much about chaos. It was sort of like a managed or controlled chaos, or maybe it was just chaos, chaos. But, um, you know, you just sort of got the sense that, that you just lived life fully and you weren't trying to minimize risk or – or, you know, control things. You were more out for the experience. You were out to live. And and I think both my parents had a great appetite for life um, that that really 
is a huge gift. I mean, there are a lot of crazy things about him, believe me, but but that that was a huge gift to both my brother and I. Because we're just we are unfazed when all sorts of crazy shit happens. <laughs> I like this idea, uh, specifically that word you mentioned, controlled chaos. You know, being able to cope with all these things that are happening in a way that's controlled. It's chaos, but it's controlled chaos. So there might be some people listening um, who might be thinking like, you know, they're worried about going out into nature. They're worried about things that could happen. Um, They're worried about the chaos of nature. You know, what do you as someone who's been through so many amazing adventures, all these ups and of course the incredible downs like you had in your beginning story, um, what advice would you give to those people who might have that sense of fear? Well, you know, not to get onto the too risky thing of like having people do things that they're not technically capable of or don't have the skills for. Um, And I'm not implying that in any way. Um, You know, I think I'm going to go back to the Nelson Mandela quote, which is our greatest fear is that we're more powerful and more capable then we almost want to acknowledge. And I think all of us have this, this, this God given or universe given or life given ability to do things. Um, and, you know, over the years of people telling us that we can't do them and society and work and everybody sort of pounding in that maybe we couldn't, that we kind of lose touch with that. Um, and I think outdoors is the perfect place to break free of that um, and just to tap into your inner strength. Um, you know, most people could do this or do m- far more than they think they can if they're just willing to let go a bit. Um, embrace the chaos. You know, there is no growth without learning experience and and some mistakes. I mean, if you're not making mistakes, you're not learning. You're not trying. The goal out out there is not to make, it's not to avoid making mistakes. It's just to correct from your mistakes and to learn from them and and know more about yourself. Um, And again, I think people, this gets back to this intention. I mean, what is your intention when you go into the backcountry? If you go into the backcountry with like, I'm, you know, I'm trying not to die. I'm trying not to, you know, get cold, wet. I'm trying not, you know, negative, 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 negative. What if you went into the backcountry and went, you know, I'm going to have an amazing experience. I'm going to see this incredible sunrise and sunset. I get all this time out with nature. Maybe I'll get to fly fish at that remote lake that, perfect hatch up, you know, let's just spin that 180 degrees. And rather than, than, than going at a fear-based approach, go look at an opportunity or growth or gratitude. And gratitude is a beautiful, wonderful, powerful tool. You could just go out and be grateful for being out there and the experience and all the gifts that you're going to receive. Let's talk actually a little bit about uh, some other adventures that you've been doing um, where there is like a sense of, you know, you might not know what's coming next and you kind of have to embrace it. Um, I saw I've seen recently that you've been doing a lot with high roots. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about like adventures you've been having with high roots and like what they are? Um, Well, that's a great question, Andrew. Um, I don't think there is any definition of a high route. Um, I think... (laughs) Um, there's, it's, it's one of those terms that I think, um, means different things to different people. Um, but to go back to, to one of the, the things about unknown outcomes, um, my, my hiking and climbing partner, my adventuring partner, Don Wilson, who was soundbited at the beginning of this, uh, of this interview, um, his, his favorite saying is, it's not an adventure if the outcome is known. Um, and I guess that's one of these senses of with these high roots is um, when you're doing them and, and people may have done every single section of the high route that you've done, but you may not know that they've done it. 
um, and you haven't done it. Um, there's just this sense that, you know, it, it might not happen. So like, give us an example of one of these, uh, high routes and like one of these adventures where you go on, on one of them and you know, you're, you're not sure of the outcome. You're not sure which, uh, how it's going to turn out like, um, the Sierra high route, for example. So Don and I did an extension of that, that, that what the original high route was, or, you know, that used the word high route was Steve Roper's Sierra high route, which he did back in the seventies. And I, it's one I cut my teeth on back in the seventies and it was a big deal. Um, but he is, and it was supposed to follow the John Muir trail, um, all the way, but it doesn't, it makes this very odd right hand turn on the Monarch divide and ends up in Kings Canyon, way shy of Mount Whitney, where the JMT goes to, and misses the finest, highest part of the Southern Sierra. And we're like, what the frick is going on with this? <laughs> so we ended up doing a route starting um, basically in the Palisades and and going down to Whitney. And actually, we go actually past Whitney, um, past the base of Mount Langley, the, the last 14 er and drop out. Um, and we feel that's much more in keeping with the, uh, the intent of, of the original high route. And so we went and, and plotted this thing out and, you know, high route, you try and find an elegant line. And, um, we had one and we were supposed to go over this, this grasshopper pass. And Don and I go up and we, we spend a very cold, frosty, condensing bivy below the pass. And we get up in the morning and we're walking towards it. And I'm like, ah, it doesn't look so great. Uh, you know, because I think what happened was it was an ice field that had melted out. And so it's just like all this gnarly, like super unstable talus and dirt. And it just, I'm like, let's go check it out. I mean, it doesn't look great. And Don's like, I don't even need to get any closer. He's like, I'm done. There's no way in hell I'm going up that. <laughs> and I'm like, really? Can't we just like walk another mile and check? And he's like, no, I'm done. <laughs> and so we, you know, we went around, found, found another way to go. But, um, you know, that's a case where there was actually beta on it out of the, um, Sake or high Sierra routes and passes. It was listed as a doable route. I don't think it is anymore. I think I think climate change has changed it into an un, unmanageable pass. So you just regroup and do it. Um, and if there's two of you and one of you doesn't want to go, then that's the end of the story. That's a perfect example. Yeah, because that's the thing about these high routes that are amazing. Like a lot of it, some of them, like the Sierra High Route, like you just mentioned, there is some beta on it, but other times there's none. You're essentially creating your own path. Um, so what? What's are there any other examples of high routes you've done where you've literally made your own path completely? I mean, we've done variants of them. I mean, own path. I mean, there's been so many people in so many places in, in the lower 48. I, I can't think of anything that you would have done in the lower 48 that somebody hasn't done. So I'm not, I, I think... I think the question of, you know, I, I, the better way to look at this is what's an elegant way to change? And a lot of these might have been a mountaineering route, um, you know, very rarely traveled. Um, so I think the better way to look at these or the way that that um, Don and I have looked at the routes that we put up is, is we're trying to give back to the, the hiking community. So this is not to prove how great we are, what badass mountaineers we are, which God knows I'm not, so I would fail at that anyway. Um, <laughs> so our idea is that in in a you know in a long week, you know that's the week with both weekends, so ten days, an average fit hiker should be able to do the route, um, and that's the design goal. So the design goal is always to turn these over and let people. As we get back to that that fear based thing, if people are willing to let go of their fear of being off trail a bit and challenge themselves a bit, there's this this huge rewarding trip that they could go on. Um, so we tend to try and keep it third class or less, um, no rope needed. You know, we sort of have this criteria of what it is, and it's a beautiful, high, elegant route that will be experiencing the outdoors without trails or very few trails in a way that people haven't before. 
Um, and, and maybe that, you know, that, that spiritual ex- experience of being really high, when you're on the high route, it's, it's like on steroids. I mean, you are, you are, when you are looking where you're putting every foot and you're needing to pay 100% attention to, to where you're going and what you're doing, you become more alive. You become more in tune with the landscape. You see more. You hear more. It's, it's a more fully engaging experience that, that we hope others will be able to enjoy. It's like basically creating a path where you're going through the absolute best sections that a high range has to offer. So it's, it's amazing stuff. That was exactly what um, Steve Roper was talking about. He's like, there's this beautiful crest of the Sierra and the John Muir Trail is like miles from it or, you know, they'll go like 25 or 30 miles through woods with no views when there's this beautiful ridge like four miles to the right. What what the frickin is going on? <laughs> um, and it, so it's a sense of, yeah, a sense of just trying to find the most beautiful and elegant line through a landscape. Um, and then once you're on it, you just you kind of let go. You kind of just yield to the experience. I'm like, I'm up here. Anything could be happening, but I'm up here for, for what's going to happen. You know, you've seen so much. You've done so much. You've had so many amazing experiences, you know, throughout the course of your life. What advice would you say you could give to people um, to be able to enjoy nature as much as possible? Well, I, I, you know, I think this is a this is a term, you know, sort of a mindfulness term that may be, again, you overused a bit and and has different interpretations. But I would go back to the word of intention. That you know, whatever you do, and I, you know, it doesn't need to be a high route. You could go hike a, a trail. Um, I I I have a walking meditation that I do in the local park next to me. I'm, I'm blessed to have a nice one. But sort of what is your intention? What do you what do you expect to get out of something? And what it is that, you know, what's your legwork? What do you need to do? And then, you know, what do you need to let go and receive? Um, but I think this is getting back to sort of looking at, I think a lot of people go into the outdoors with a sense of fear, like this is, could go wrong. I could get Lyme disease. I could get struck by lightning. There could be a rainstorm. And, you know, they're they're going in with, with this sense, uh, sort of this fear-based sense. And I think the, the, the way to spin it around with the intention is like, what amazing things could happen to me? You know, what, 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 uh, you know, I mean, the bottom line is if you go out into nature and you're even remotely observant, um, it's a wonderful experience. It's a gift. Um, and I think just going out with the intention you know, maybe you're going out, you haven't seen a friend in a long time, and you're just going to be outdoors and enjoy the beauty and have a good conversation. Maybe you want to go fly fishing. Maybe you want to just go and hammer your brains out and, and test your body physically and, and mentally. Um, you know, I think there's all sorts of ways to go about doing this. But I think it's just this, this sense of love of life and, and being open to what happens and and to experience it um, as opposed to just sort of trying to do damage control, which is, I think, how a lot of people just sort of start out on the trail. That's actually exactly how I started out my through hike on the Appalachian Trail. I was always wondering about what could go wrong, um, what, uh, you know, what what's not going to go right today or what uh, issue am I going to have that could potentially derail my hiking day or even my through hike and then this realization over time, the more time that you're spending in nature, this feeling of whatever problem comes up, there's a solution for it. Um, there's not anything that can't that can come up that you can't deal with. And to be able to find the beauty in those challenges, it makes you grow stronger as a person and it gives you even greater experiences. Yeah, or just, you know, going up and going, you know, when I get to the top of this thing, I'm going to just have a freaking amazing view. <laughs> you know, I'm going to sit down and really enjoy it, you know, um, as opposed to thinking about, oh, you know, am I going to get a blister? Is it going to be too steep or too hard? I mean, you know, uh, the, goal is to, the goal is to just get out and enjoy life and, and appreciate what's around you. It's there. You know, there's this sense of, you know, I'm, 
of these these spiritual awakenings or something is that we come home and realize that we were always there. We just didn't know it. And I think that, you know, we all know how to enjoy nature. We all know how to just let go and have fun. And we just, we just need to come home and rediscover that we always had that, that capability and that need. I was also curious about like the type of ultralight adventures you would be going on because I know something else um you're really popular for is uh how how excellent you've become at ultralight backpacking. Um I'm doing a lot of guiding this year so I'll be guiding um up north of the Arctic Circle and so that's where we actually teach people how to go ultralight um and we challenge them and a lot of people are are very challenged as we're doing the pre-hike shakedown and we just start yanking stuff out of their pack. And this is, of course, after they thought that they got it down to the minimum and we, you know, we'd done some online training and they were still yanking stuff out of their packs. Um, but, uh, you know, I, when I hiked the AT myself, you know, I'm carrying about Five to seven pounds of gear. Ooh, wow, five to seven pounds. How many? Uh, how many days are you able to go on five seven pounds? I I did a recent, just sort of just to test the concept. I did the the Shenandoah, um, and this is actually not through hiker mileage. I mean, somebody like Anish or one of the really truly gifted through hikers. Like I'll be actually be guiding with. Uh, String bean, Joe McConaughey, I'll be guiding with him. But I did with a 10 pound pack and that included food and water. Um, I went from Enden and Shenandoah National Park, which is a little over 100 miles in three days. Wow. So it, it's really all you need. Um, you know, this is just this self sufficient th- thing. It's, you know, the person that's, you're the, you're the motor that's going to get you through, through there. You're the brain. It's kind of all up to you. Um, and um, it's it's not that you have to do it that way. And I really, I'm I'm a big believer of hike your own hike. But that's that's how I like to do it. To me, it's just it's a very it's a very elegant sort of minimalist way to get into the outdoors. Yeah, and a way you can you know be able to hike a little further without your knees absolutely destroying you at the end of the day. Um, what would you say the main things when you're doing shakedowns with people? Um, what are the main uh, items you see people too often carrying with them that they probably don't need? So people pack for their fears and people got lots of fears. <laughs> and that's true. And that's, it's amazing. Yeah. How it does all circle back to that concept of its fear. It's almost it's self deprecation. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, and people, people bring a two person tent when they're only one person and we'll try and talk them into a tarp, you know, um, or, you know, they'll bring, they're afraid they're going to go hungry. They'll bring tons of food or they're afraid they're going to be cold. They'll bring tons of clothes, you know, and this idea again, that somehow I am not enough, but if I bring all this stuff, it'll make up for my deficiencies. Um, and, you know, going back to they're they're all fully capable of going out with tons less stuff. They just don't know it. And they're not willing to take the risk to find out. So how about you? How about your transition into ultralight? Was it like, did you have any of those feelings um, when you first started like really cutting down on your base weight um, and like taking certain items that in the past you hadn't taken on backpacking trips? I did a trip to take my my own kids into the mountains in the Sierras in the the late 90s. And I did it old school and it was just so awful. It was so miserable. Uh, (laughs) I'm like, and I, you know, like they say, you have to hit rock bottom before you change. I was just so unhappy with that trip. And I was thinking of Bill Dane, and I started investigating ultralight and um, I like, I'm done. I, I went from a 50 pound pack to a 12 pound pack and never looked back. I'm just like, I slept under a tarp. I had a hip beltless pack. I mean, I just, when I that's that focus thing. I when I do something, I don't just do it half assed. I I do it all the way. Even doing the Appalachian Trail, like and no and trying to uh, bring down my base weight as far as I can. The concept of like five to five pounds for you know a three day hike is just amazing to me. So that's that does show commitment and just being able to go all in on it and do so well with it. So 
Well, it also helps to be an engineer. I'm very good at analyzing this stuff. Um, I've been, you know, ultralight backpacking for over 20 years now. Um, so, you know, I've got a wealth of experience to dig into and I know I'm going to be okay. Like I'm, you know, there's no fear that I, that I'm not going to be okay with this gear. Um, so, uh, you know, the, that's all gone. And that's where it comes down to again, you know, the, the self-trust, self-confidence, um, and being prepared and trusting that things are going to go just perfectly well. Just as a wrap up, you know, I was curious, like any, what are any other additional, you know, advice or, you know, tips on appreciating nature and not even just appreciating the outdoors, just like for life in general. Um, are there any other additional thoughts you wanted to share with us about that? I'm actually going to go back to, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I just read the book, John O'Donoghue, his book on beauty, but he talks about having a friend who is, was very depressed. Um, and I think they actually, they didn't have health insurance. They got something, but I forget, but, um, he said, I tell you what, he said, why don't you just make sure that you see dawn and sunset each day for a week and come back and tell me how you feel. And he met her a week later and, and, and she was doing much better. So I, there's no substitute just for getting out and experiencing it. Um, there's almost no way to screw it up. <laughs> I think the, the the question is we just don't get out enough. And I think that's our legwork. You know, I have this concept that, you know, there's a certain amount of legwork that I need to do and then the universe will provide. But if I don't do the legwork, it's not going to happen. And I think our legwork is just to show up. And give nature permission, essentially. Yeah. Like, I'm here. I showed up. I'm here. I'm, I'm walking. And the rest is kind of up, up to nature, the universe. And, and we were observant and receptive. And my experience is it always happens. Are there any other additional thoughts you wanted to share with us? Um, I mean, there was one other point here. It's just, you know, I'm, I'm uh, turned 60 this year. Absolutely. So, yeah, I was going to say with you turning 60 this year, and congrats, by the way, um, what advice do you give for somebody who's, you know, approaching the age of 60? You know, I think it sort of gets back to the answer that was just like, just show up and do it. Um, you know, it's, it's as simple as just getting out and, and, and walking and doing things and being out, you know, Allison and I were, my wife were elite triathletes for the last 15 years. Uh, you know, I went to Olympic kayaking and, Try, uh, trials and kayaking. I mean, I've been a lifelong athlete, but part of that is I've just never stopped. And I'm always moving. And if I've had an injury, I do like three different sports. So I swim, I bike, I run. So I always, doing nothing is not an option. <laughs> you know, if I get no, no off button, right? There's no off button. <laughs> uh, you know, just, I, <laughs> I, I fully convinced that I will be out on the, John Muir Trail with a walker, just putting the walker two feet in front of me, walking up to it. But um, yeah, it's just like, I think people don't realize, I, mean, I think people set very high goals for themselves. Um, and, and really all they need to do is get up and show up. I mean, just get to a trailhead, start walking. It's the first two steps that are the hardest every step along the way gets easier. The hardest thing is to get those first two feet at the trail. So just get your feet on a trail. Uh, it doesn't matter how heavy you are, how in shape you are, just that you have two feet on a trail and you intend on moving forward. That's all it takes. That's good enough. Thank you so much, Alan, for sharing all these stories with us. We really, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, good luck to you and everything. And hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for the time, Andrew. It's been a, been a pleasure talking. Adventurer, ultralight backpacker, guide, 
and good friend, Adventure Alan Dixon. My sincere thanks to him for being on the show. To learn more about Alan, make sure to check out his website, AdventureAllen.com, and catch him on Facebook and Instagram under his handle, Adventure Allen. We'll make sure to include a link in our show notes, which you can find on GaiaGPS.com slash blog, and then look for the podcast link in the upper right-hand corner. Up next... We're going to have a fun chat with Liz Thomas, who's known in the hiking community as Snorkel, a former FKT holder for the Appalachian Trail and former VP of the American Long Distance Hikers Association West. She's going to talk with me about how to properly budget for a through hike. And as you'll learn, I did not budget well for my AT through hike. And we're also going to talk about through hiking that she has done in American cities. Seriously. We're talking about my kind of through hike, hitting all the breweries in Denver. To find out how she did it and why you might love doing something like that, you got to make sure to catch our next show with Snorkel. And speaking of the Out and Back podcast, if you like it, please let us know. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts and share it on social media and with your friends. And also, don't forget to grab that really nice 50% discount on a Gaia GPS membership by going to GaiaGPS.com slash podcast or hit up the link in our show notes on the Gaia GPS blog. We'll catch you next time. And so for now, this is Shanti. Take care. <laughs>